To forget. You have to forget bad things. Do you like to forget? It's not always possible. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 113, Back to Cole's Choice. What are we covering today? We have a real treat for international film lovers with this episode because we are talking about Los Tallos Amargos, or The Bitter Stems, from 1956. And that's directed by Fernando Ayala and starring Carlos Correz, Aida Luz, Vasily Lambrinos, Julio Sandoval, and Pablo Moray. It was photographed by Ricardo Yunis, a protege of Greg Toland who shot Citizen Kane, and you can definitely see some of the lessons that were imparted here. It has an incredible score from Astor Piazzolla, and it was adapted from the award-winning novel by Adolfo Hasca. It's about an insecure newspaper man in Buenos Aires who goes in with a Hungarian expatriate on a scam revolving around a bogus correspondence school, which dupes other aspiring journalists out of their money. Increasingly paranoid, our writer finally commits an irreversible act of desperation, which spirals out of control in the most film noir of ways. This is only Ayala's second feature film in what would become a long career, 40 plus films altogether. So, so much for the sophomore slump, right? Pretty astounding to think of that. It won the Silver Condor, which is the Argentinian Oscar for both Best Picture and Best Director. Now, this Silver Condor thing, is this just something that I do, giving more weight to certain other countries' equivalent of the Oscar? Because I will talk trash about the Oscars and how they are inconsequential garbage all day long. But if you tell me something's won a Silver Condor, which is a cool image for a statue, by the way. I hope each statue is about eight feet tall. (laughs) or a Cesar, or a Goya, and I think, okay, I should check this out. Do you do the same thing? I am right there with you. I don't know why I place so much importance on it, because really, I guess this could be Argentina's crash, I guess, if it comes to it. But I do think of those awards in high standing. Do you have even a grudging amount more respect for the Oscars or a fondness for it than I do? I guess probably. I mean, if you're starting at zero for you, anything (laughs) above that would be more admiration. But I think if everyone involved had not gone on to do other amazing things, we might think less, but everyone here is on their A-game. Right, because it's an adaptation of Adolfo Hoska's novel of the same name, which won the Emese Award when he submitted it. And for context, think Man Booker Prize or the Penn Faulkner Award for that. It was one of Argentina's most significant literary awards. My point overall is this thing has an incredible pedigree. Contributors who would become among the most revered in their fields, a major award winner. So what I'm left wondering, before we even get started here, how do films like this get lost? I find it a little baffling how little care is taken with these artifacts sometimes. Because there's a difference between films that we don't think about as much today, something like A Man for All Seasons, that was very well known in its time, and then something that was truly lost as this was. I keep thinking, does this have anything to do with politics? It doesn't quite seem to be, though a case could be made for that, but I couldn't find any distinctive reason as to why this was not kept. No, it just sort of seemed to slip through the cracks, and I know that this happened all the time throughout the history of cinema, and my feelings about it are probably likely only indicative of me investing what most people think of as a disposable entertainment commodity with too much significance just because I love film so much. It's always been considered disposable, even by some of the people that create the films throughout history. And I get it in the 30s, maybe, before archiving and catalog had taken on the importance that it would later. But this was into the mid-50s at this point, and it was a huge title in Argentinian cinema. Imagine, for example, if On the Waterfront disappeared completely within a couple years of its release, and a couple of generations were totally unaware of it until a decaying copy of it showed up 
in somebody's garden shed in La Jolla in 2014. Ava Perone was already dead at this point, so we can't blame her for it. <laughs> it absolutely makes me want to raise my fists at the heavens and wonder what else is out there. Yeah, exactly. It's maddening. But you're right. What a joy it is when someone makes this discovery and saves something so incredible from oblivion. So bless all of you people out there sorting through basements, crawling around in attics, pulling up floorboards in barns, and even digging into the permafrost sometimes to save these films. You are doing the Lord's work. So let's get into the film. This is not quite as well-known an entity as we usually have on the show. How would you introduce this to people? It was an unknown quantity for me, so I was wondering, what is Argentinian noir going to look like? What's it going to feel like? What are those motivations going to be? So I'm going to warn the listening audience the same way that Eddie Muller warned the audience at one of the TCM film festivals a few years back. When he showed this, he said, if you entered the theater in a good mood, sorry, <laughs> because you're going to experience film noir the way film noir is really supposed to be. Yeah, this is prime film noir for me. The atmosphere and the moodiness on this thing go to 11, as the very first thing that happens is that our main characters get out of a taxi in a shadow-strewn town square with a bell tower ringing out in the background. My money is that it is a church tower for good measure. There's even a one-way sign. Yeah, all the signs are there. Ask not for whom this bell tolls. It <laughs> tolls for this guy buying a one-way ticket before the credits even roll. I am definitely picking up what this is putting down, and I am loving every second of how blatantly noir this opening sequence is. The other fantastic element of this title sequence is Aster Piazzolla asserting himself. This score is amazing. Like most people... I think of him in relation to the tango and how he revolutionized that. But there's a lot more happening in this score than that. It does appear there are a couple of instances of dance lessons, but there are also great moments of musical melodrama, especially in this opening. You get this very clear sense of the mean streets of Buenos Aires. And then there's a fantastic sequence with the brassy big band at the club unbeknownst to them, actually playing a critical role in the plot. Music is not just aural wallpaper in this. It contributes to mood and story. I love that touch here of the swell of the score becoming the noise of the train. And the film is also distinguished by a really noir touch, which is that confessional narration, especially as it's revealing the main character's dark motivations. Structurally, the movie is sort of split in two. The first half of it happens primarily in flashback on this ill-fated train trip with our two principals, Gaspar, the journalist who is plotting the murder of our other traveler, Luidas. Because it's revealed right away, you know, Luidas is going to die. I wanted to ask you about one of the devices that they use here. If you put yourself in this situation, would you notice if your traveling partner is so disconnected as to be virtually absent, or if you're on the other side, would you be so preoccupied with your preparations and anxiety over your evil plan that you would completely check out the way Gasper has here? I think if we were doing a satire of this on stage, Gasper would be in the corner stroking his beard, <laughs> doing his sotto voce, which is not so sotto voce, talking about how all of this is going to go down while Liudas is practically skipping rope over to the side. I want to talk to you a little bit about that too, because... I'm always taken with these scenes when one of the two people is obviously so disengaged and the other one doesn't seem to notice. But in this case, it's shaded by how you consider Leodas and what you think is his capacity for subterfuge. Does he notice and is ignoring it because he's working a con of his own and can't jeopardize that? Does he not notice because of the genuine joy of being reunited with his family in short order? They smartly leave that Rorschach test up to the viewer at this early point in the film, along with this added wrinkle that Liras is ignorant of the mortal danger he is in, whatever his ultimate aim is. Plus, I love how the flashback also performs another archetypal noir function, giving us this classic, tragic framework of, how did I end up here? My life was so different just a short time ago. I think tragic is an interesting word because we learn so much about Gaspar, specifically because of what one of his colleagues says to him. It's established right away that he's deeply unsatisfied with his lot in life, his pay, how journalism has failed to fulfill his grandiose dreams. 
And this colleague says, you have this need to obey, especially someone or something grand. I really can't remember the last time I heard someone described that way in a film. So he's obviously walking around in a slump a lot of the time, but in our life, you know when I've checked out, I know when you've checked out, which I think says neither of us are so oblivious to what's going round. Oh, what's that? I wasn't listening. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Good one. You're right about this. I have the same thing in my notes. There is more going on with Gasper than we sometimes see with noir characters. This is a more psychologically complex treatment of the main character than we're often used to. Like you say, he's being run down professionally. He has money problems. This isn't the adventure that he imagined it to be. And that's sort of the crux of the thing. Here's where the character development goes beyond cookie cutter. He is self-absorbed to an amazing degree. He wants to be a hero. He has a sort of narcissistic entitlement without evidence of the kind of talent that might justify it that we wouldn't see dissected to this degree in pop culture in very many instances in the 50s especially. And I like that touch that you bring up. I like that he's warned repeatedly by colleagues, by acquaintances, by lovers, that he's not really that grand and he needs to rein it in. He's being diagnosed by everyone, it seems like. Gasper, it's not us, it's you. So it's not tragic in terms of something being done to him that he's so put upon. It's all coming from him. Yes, he absolutely thinks he's destined for greatness. He has this night out with his girlfriend, and it's equally unsatisfying. She gets the sense that he's bored by her, and there is this what seems to be incidental war film that they're going to see. And this war film seems to set him off somehow. We don't quite understand why at this point. But he says, my life is worthless and unimportant. It obviously affects him profoundly, but I think Ayala was also shooting beyond him to the audience as well. This, I think, is a sneakily subversive moment, and I really enjoy it. Because what they're confronted with in this film is this super phallic montage of large caliber guns blowing into the sky. Fernando Ayala was always a vocal social critic, and he often took the military to task, so I have no doubt that this is intentional and intended to be satirical. For me, it plays like an indictment of the impotence that underlies that sort of chest-thumping and posturing. And history, I think, bears me out a little bit. As the years progressed, Ayala would never stop picking on those sore spots of Argentina's body politic. His career is really interesting as he began sort of at the tail end of what you would consider the classic Argentinian studio system, and then he transitioned into the new auteur-driven cinema of the 60s. It's a similar trajectory to someone like, say, Norman Jewison, but that had more political and cultural impact in his native country. Because the time that he was working in was incredibly dangerous to be making statements like he does. Yeah, he really is one of the linchpins of their national cinema, and his production company, interestingly, they turned out vital works for three decades, and he refined this system of one for them, one for us, where he would take a more commercial venture and then follow that up with something that was a more incisive social critique. So he would lure audiences in with this entertainment, and before they knew it, they were going along on this journey with him that basically laid out all of the significant issues and class struggles that permeated Argentinian culture as far back as anyone cared to look. Without him, among others, leading this first wave of the new cinema, quote-unquote, in Argentina, we likely don't have someone like Lucrecia Martel, one of our favorites, in the second wave. Gasper's life is about to intersect here with what seems to be a random stranger, as characters in these stories often do. At first, I don't know about you, but I thought it was going to be this nightclub singer... We only see photos of, but instead, it's this oddly charismatic bartender. And that bartender is Liudas, who is clearly staring at him, seems to have marked him, seems to be seeking him out. Why do you think that is? It doesn't play as a sexual kind of thing here, but Liudas seems to have found him. It's because an easy mark is just blood in the water. You cannot miss them if you are of a certain mindset. I give you this example all the time when we're driving, say if we're in heavy traffic. I can scan the road ahead of us and invariably I can see where my gap is. Right there, that's my bitch. And I'm going to exploit this opening. You sound like Jaws. <laughs> Truly though, it is very much that thing. Anyone who thinks this way 
you can walk into a room and it is easy within five minutes to sniff out the weak, the insecure, the one that you can most easily prey upon. I'm so glad that you said that because I never really would have thought of it that way. You're not as much of a sociopath, I guess. I guess as not. I am. But his eyes target that guy. Yeah, it's absolutely true. In a traditional noir, we would expect the femme fatale to be doing this, and it would be an obvious play. But it goes along with all these great classic touches on display here, too, because even just arriving at the place, dissatisfied with everything in his life, he finds himself wandering the streets at night listless bored and he ends up lured into the club by the promise of an exotic woman this is a textbook noir bad decision as this is where it all starts to go wrong tellingly though in a voiceover he blames chavez the other bartender for setting this in motion for introducing him to leodas it's a perfect bit of characterization i see this in my true crime ramblings all the time the narcissist criminal can never fully take responsibility for himself it's been studied extensively in the decades since then, but I think this is a pretty prescient character detail in the criminal profile for 1956. We'll be learning about what this scheme is going to be in a bit, but we get more of Gasper's interior home life. He still lives at home. He's 32 at this point, and his mother seems to do everything for him. Now, this is, of course, not unheard of, especially around the time. Families living all together until someone gets married just for the sake of economics. But when we see him at home in what also seems to be his childhood bedroom, it does seem like some arrested development here. Yeah, it goes beyond still just living at home, I think. We see after this late night of carousing, he returns home. He gets to sleep in that tiny bed just as the rest of the household is beginning their day. And we're treated to this fantastic dream sequence with all of the elements that are pressing down on him, some that we're aware of, some that only reveal themselves in his subconscious. The exotic woman, the bartender, money, war, the impact of his mother, the death of his father. It's a little reminiscent of that dream sequence that Dolly contributed to Spellbound. The psychology of this thing, it taps into an area that we don't often see explored in traditional film noir the influence of the parents in the development of our tragic figure. This feeling of being destined for more, how much of that do you think comes from his mother's coddling? Because as a man in his mid-30s, like you mentioned, she babies him. It's beyond just he still lives there. And then how much of that is driven by the need for his father's approval that he can now never get? It seems like in his mind, it definitely comes from them. In my mind, it comes straight from Gasper. It's developed by his own thwarted dreams, desires, limited talent, any of these other circumstances that he can blame. Now, do you see noir purists being put off by these more surreal experimental touches, like the psychological underpinnings of the character or the dream sequence? I guess if all you're looking for are cigarettes and shadows from Venetian blinds, maybe, but it just excites me. It's so interesting and fascinating. And I love that we're delving more deeply into a character that I haven't seen before. Yeah, it is definitely hardcore noir in a lot of respects. But there are some ways, I guess, that the movie is unconventional for the genre. For example, it's missing some key elements like a femme fatale. It's more tragedy noir. And I mean going all the way back to antiquity tragedy. And that femme fatale role will even be twisted as we get further along. Now, the scheme that he and Leota set up, it's a scam for a journalism correspondence school, and it turns out to be profitable. There are suckers everywhere. Why journalism as a choice, do you think? That has to be specific, right? How do you feel that undermining and exploiting the media fit into the cultural backdrop in Argentina at the time? I have to say, at first, I didn't really understand the scam. I didn't see how it would work, but then I started to think of the specter these days of for-profit colleges like DeVry and what seemed to be these constant searches for actual work from home that you could do to build a better life for yourself. And in the film, journalism definitely seems to be thought of as a lucrative profession. See the world, expose corruption, which of course was definitely going to be in people's minds. And when they start to imagine who might be interested in this, we see a lot of what seemed to be wage slaves or provincial young men yearning for something better. 
it also has to be a comment on those periods in Argentinian time when the journalists would be expurgated. I think it's a little interesting, actually, when I look at it, how Juan Perón's first tenure as president of Argentina lines up exactly with the prime noir period for them, 1949 to 1952. Coincidence? Absolutely not. Around the world, World War II, that post-war time, is prime noir territory. It's a huge motivator. And it's something that's constantly in my mind when we watch international noir. And this was no exception. I was delighted to see, oh, it crosses all sorts of boundaries. So it's important, I think, that the ultimate goal behind this scheme that Liu Das has concocted is to bring his wife and two kids over from Europe. In our minds, we're thinking war-torn, deprived Europe. And he also talks about how there are idiots and morons everywhere. But in Gasper's mind, this has set up this heroic goal, bring these people over, save these people. You put a pretty nice spin on it, and the film does too, but we have to address something that's going unspoken here. You talk about war-torn Europe and Europeans coming over to Argentina. There's a very specific subset of travelers there too. Absolutely. This aspiration that we see in this film, this longing for a better life, Perón, he was heartily endorsed by the working class because his reforms brought more parity to the class structure of Argentina than it had seen in a long time. But on the other hand, his admiration for fascists was troublesome to say the least. Argentina being a haven for Nazi war criminals during his tenure is no coincidence. So, by the way, before the war, there was a very well-organized pro-Nazi element controlled by the German ambassador in Argentina. And in 1945 through 1946, like you mentioned, Perón allowed, quietly, a number of Nazi leaders fleeing from Europe to settle in Argentina. That number surpassed 300 Nazi fugitives. Now, previous to this point, Argentina was definitely a Germanophile country, and they were pretty anti-British. And this goes back a long way. They were neutral in World War I, the war in the Pacific, and then through World War II up until the very end. There are conflicting views about why this is. Is this a rejection of democracy or an admiration for German military history? Perón said, we're not Nazis, we don't believe in Nazis, but there are these great things about Germany. Find people on both sides. Yeah. The Allies all through this period were pressing Argentina and really all Latin American countries to get on the side of the Allies. The U.S. wanted every country to join so that there would be basically a continent-wide resistance against the Axis powers. But it wasn't until a month before the actual end of the war that Argentina finally declared war against the Axis powers. So you might not be thinking of Argentina playing a big role in the war. However, 4,000 Argentines did serve as volunteers in all three of the British Armed Services. So they were present, there were opportunities, and this is going to be a big point here in just a moment. So do you think film noir in Argentina developed organically the way it did here, for instance, as part of a post-war malaise that was genuine? Or do you think they absorbed more of that after having seen cinematic imports reflecting those values from elsewhere. Gosh, it's hard to say. They were not completely ignorant of the war. There was information constantly. There was pressure put on the Argentine government all the time. There were blockades. It affected their economy. So I think it was a big deal. I think it did play a role. But in our specific character's case, more of that internal motivation. Well, not having seen it firsthand, I obviously can't say for sure what the connections specifically might be. But like you, I tend to think that none of these things are accidents. Argentinian filmmaking is so much more directly intertwined with politics than we are used to in the U.S. We had censorship with the Hayes Code. We had the Hollywood 10 and the Red Scare. And I certainly don't mean to diminish what people suffered through with McCarthyism. I know lives were destroyed and people faced significant hardship in the professional and personal arena, but we have never had to try to make art in the midst of a pervasive atmosphere of dictatorship, insurrection, and terrorism. We don't have to say things like, a new era in American cinema started with the arrival of democracy in 1983, like they have to in Argentina. It's a hard thing to fathom. In comparison to that, 
our artists are working from a distinctly more comfortable and privileged position, we don't have to draw a line, for instance, between pre- and post-junta cinema. And so more and more, I'm thinking that Gasser here is one of the oddest characters I've encountered. No one is specifically asking or blaming him, but he's clearly haunted by the fact that he did not volunteer and go fight in the war. Up to the point where he says that waging war is the con. Not the con that we're doing, and that he couldn't leave his mother and sister. You said a couple of things that I want to talk about before we go a little bit further about Leodas, and I think he has two things in particular on his side in perpetuating this scheme. One, he's a risk taker. And two, he is cognizant enough of both the public sentiment and Gasper's insecurities that he easily convinces Gasper of the perception of journalists as exalted. Gasper's lover, Susanna, she sees through it, though, even at a distance, and she calls out the con of it all. Leodas is obviously morally flexible, shall we say, but with Gasper, is he driven to it, or was that always there? I think it was always there, waiting for the opportunity. And Susanna again says something really important, that really, whatever this motivation, you would have found some cause, you would have found some way to justify this, even if Luidas doesn't have this family that needs saving. Right, and so the suckers start lining up, and that includes Gasper, in this case, whose name this entire enterprise is in. Leodas keeps himself free of any legal entanglement in all this with very reasonable excuses, and he mentions, like you say, morons believe, morons pay, and that applies across the board. The reason I ask about Gasper's moral flexibility is because his motivation swings like a pendulum. It feels like, whichever way the wind blows, saving Leodas' family at this point, this becomes his war, his adventure. Once again, though, it's not just Susanna that does this. He's called out by his newspaper colleague, Andriani, again. He's not exceptional. How many voices of reason do you need? You just need the one telling you what you already believe or what you already want to believe. And for him, for Gasper, I think it's most importantly that you're the big man here. Meanwhile, back on the train, there are just a couple of stations before their final stop, and the clock is now ticking on this train ride and the end of the line. There's a beautiful line here that I love. On the surface, so innocent, but so full of potential menace. Tomorrow we'll work in the garden. Well, one of us will, anyway. <laughs> but this rain-soaked train station that they arrive at, this is all pure noir. The aesthetic here, both the writing and the imagery, is first rate throughout this entire movie. And that's happening in a couple of ways. The embrace of the traditional, and then how they break from that, too. There's another nice variation on a stock noir character that I like here. We don't have a stereotypical femme fatale, nor, for example, the standard wife that doesn't have much agency. Susanna, Gasper's lover, she is on the ball and self-assured, but she's not predatory, she's not conniving. She's constantly asking the right questions, including one that really got my attention. There is an instance of her questioning if the relationship is worth it. She actually says that. And this is a type of examination and personal inventory taking that standard noir films sometimes don't spend much time on. And I really love its inclusion here. Even though she doesn't have much screen time, it's details like this that make her a much more rounded character than normal in a part like that. And the fact that her character is given this uncharacteristic depth it also gives her the gravity to make Gasper, in turn, question his faith. Even that questioning of his faith seems to turn inward in a different way or get malignant pretty quickly. He's found documents that make him question Luidas, that maybe he's being conned, maybe Luidas is going to take all the money. He's clearly applying for citizenship, so he's planning to stay, but then there's also this private phone call with a woman that he doesn't want Gasper to overhear. Yeah, Gasper's madness is really picking up steam now. And he actually goes beyond just this eavesdropping. He follows Leodas and he's spying on him at this club. And I love this touch of the band dictating what Gasper can hear, which leads him to finalize this diabolical plan based on evidence that he has potentially completely misinterpreted. It's great. I immediately thought, I don't know if you thought of this, I immediately wondered if Coppola had seen this because he basically straight lifts this idea for the conversation. Ah, good point. 
It pushes Gasper to his breaking point. And I mentioned way back that we had a little bit of a twist on the femme fatale. There's a character here, Elena, who is with Liudas, and we think maybe she is going to be the motivation for some of this con. She's not, or at least not in the way that we think. She's definitely not going to come between these people. But I love here that that madness, this road that Gasper is going down, is coinciding with Liudas saying his son's name, Harvest, almost as a totem, over and over and over again. It's ringing in Gasper's ears at this point. Are we beyond the point of no return here, do you feel like, in terms of Gasper's characterization? I don't think we're ever beyond the point of no return. In his mind, I'm sure we are. Well, the seed of the idea comes to him when Gasper's mother and sister are going away for a few days. He's going to have the house all to himself. And here's where the deal goes down. It's brilliant. We have this tableau that's all blown fuses, thunderstorms, and sledgehammers. I'm thinking back to another great and immortal work, and that is Murder, She Wrote. And there was a recent episode that we were watching with the great Wingshauser. And Jessica was talking about how you have to convince yourself that there are no other paths, that murder is the only way to go down. And I think that Gasper has clearly done this. The brutality, on the other hand, is an extra little spice in the sauce, completely coming from him. It is a brutal killing, but he's definitely ready to go. I read it as he sent his mother and sister away. I thought he had been planning this for at least a week or a few days because he's got that burial plot in the garden all ready to go in his mind. Brutal, yes, but it's a moody murder, too. This whole sequence looks incredible. Lightning is practically a character in this scene. A little tip, even though we're obviously a fan of the device, digging a grave by lantern light means that you are going to miss evidence. And there will be no symbolic purification on this night. The rain is not going to wash this away. The outlook of this film is so completely fatalistic that I never thought he was going to get away with this, did you? I didn't, but he does at least for a bit, and he's clearly got a story handy and sets about really trying to erase Leodas from his own life. Burning his things like you burnt my heroic ideals, he literally says. So the big question I'm left with is something that you just referred to. What merits murder here? The obvious answer is nothing. His narcissism and paranoia have reached peak levels here. And that interior monologue that you're talking about is just chilling. It started to remind me a bit of Purple Noon, but if Tom Ripley had been the person who had been killed and Philippe came out on top, at least for the moment. From the very start of this thing, I got the idea that Gasper wouldn't be able to keep it together a la the telltale heart. Even though, you say, he seems pretty comfortable at first looking out on Leudis' grave every day, But there's really a literary, especially, lineage of paranoia leading to murder that this belongs to that you can just feel in your bones. It's even more wretched than Poe. We're talking Dostoevsky level of wretchedness here. So Gasper is wrapping up all these loose ends so that no one will miss Liras. Gasper is living his best life now until this telegram arrives from Harvis. Harvis is real. And he arrives on Monday and then he's walking through the door. By the way, was it a coincidence that this kid is basically a blonde Aryan? Yeah, I wondered about that too. I don't typically think of Hungarians like that. And his arrival, it ratchets up the tension for a number of reasons. When he appears there in the doorway, the first thing I'm wondering is harvest another loose end that has to be eliminated. Is this poor kid going to die? But then as they launch into this great showing him around Buenos Aires montage, I begin to wonder and realize I'm not sure who might be the cat or the mouse, and so it creeps into my thoughts, is Harvest legit? Does he know what's happened, and he's playing it cool until he can exact his revenge? Same for me. I was wondering, who's gaslighting who? Then they go to the club and meet Leodas' friend Elena. Is this a coincidence or a setup? I think I've really caught a case of Gasper's paranoia here, because the possibility for nasty noir comeuppances are making my head spin at this point. And also, not to mention a noirish touch that could have happened, which is that she seduces Harvest, but it does not go down that road. 
And while we're talking about noir touches in this sequence, there is a brilliant shot in the club of Gasper behind bamboo bars that seems to confirm all my suspicions, which reminds me that I need to track down more films that Ricardo Yunis shot. Before that moment way back in the club the first time, those increasingly tight close-ups are really fun too. But all those fears are eventually allayed. Harvest turns out to be on the up and up, and he and Esther, Gasper's sister, they hit it off, even though she is wearing those disgusting eyeglasses. What do you think is Spanish for guys don't make passes at girls who wear glasses? (laughs) I don't know. I will never get that old saw. Because glasses make you look smart, and that's sexy case closed. Absolutely, and if you take them off while you're riding a bike, you're going to fall over. So if he's going to keep Harvest close and not kill him, he has somebody else that he has to take care of, and that's Elena. He goes to confront her, and we get that full story told in really interesting bits pulled out of her. Essentially, they were in love, and... She is kind of the hooker with a heart of gold, sort of, trying to get out of her lot in life, but truly loving him, the only man she ever loved. And it turns out that the pivotal nightclub scene was their last meal together. He is indeed planning to bring his whole family over, and she knows that if they had stayed involved, he wouldn't be able to leave her. So she's doing the noble thing, also quite noirish. I love how this scene exposes Gasper's ignorance of everything. He is scrambling to keep Harvest from her, but much like Susanna, Elena's struggle, like you describe, is complicated beyond stock concerns. And Gasper doesn't understand much about her, least of all that she is grappling with knowing that Liras will never come back for her. One thing you didn't mention that I wonder if you noticed, in this sequence she describes that she was facing, quote, the cost of an operation, unquote. I did notice that, but I didn't register it. That she is in Dutch for, and I can only assume that's a code for abortion, wouldn't you guess, in this case? Oh, gosh. Which serves to both underline Liras' lax morality and her deep attachment to him. Because we're not for any of these characters, right? We may feel sympathy, but we certainly don't want any of them to achieve their basic aims in the way that they're going about them. But it's conflicting, you're right. In flashback... Liras laments his corruption to Elena, of which she seems to be a part, so that's complicated. His motives were honorable, but his method is dirty, and then he feels guilty because he feels like he's corrupted Gasper as well. So there's clearly conflict within him. He's right on all counts. He's a jerk. And it's also what Gasper believes, that Liras has corrupted him, but through the looking glass. So it's all so beautifully complicated and each person is like their own corrupted private island. No one truly understands what's happening with the other characters in their orbit. This is so much richer than your average boilerplate noir. It weaves a lot of complicated motivation into these 90 minutes that sets it apart from the rest of the pack, not to mention it is super dark. The fundamentally good people get punished as much as any villain. Now, faced with all these revelations... Gasper breaks, which is frightening because we have just entered into no living witness territory. Now what must he do? Turns out, nothing. As he's confessing, we see Elena is dead. And the first thing that occurred to me was that he had done it in a moment of sort of red mist. That we're going to see his hands around her neck, but that's not the case. No, as it turns out, she has killed herself. And this is a perfectly written and performed bit because we see the realization in his face that he has confessed to a dead woman, and now that he has gotten that pesky guilt out of his system, he's free and clear. Well, everything's coming up roses for (laughs) everybody. It's tied up nicely. Harvest and Esther are engaged. Everyone seems to be generally fine, everyone living, without Leodas, except, of course, the remaining family in Europe, which we don't come back to. Yeah, it's all in the family, as Harvest and Esther are obliviously playing on Leodas' grave together. The best part, of course, here is this bit of narration when Gasper is looking out on this horizon in the garden and says, I don't want to pay my debt. The more I learn about this guy, the more I think he's a jerk. As this voiceover is happening... Harvest notices plants growing in the yard from seeds that he had sent to his father. And he begins to dig at these stems to find that they're bitter, more bitter than they're supposed to be. 
And in the course of this digging, he decides he's going to transplant the plants that have grown from the seeds. And in response to this, Gasper turns away and just begins indiscriminately running. Not much of a poker face here. Can I tell you really briefly about the Amargo plant, by the way? Yeah, let's hear it. It's this small tropical tree. It's indigenous to several areas, including Argentina. And it's got these beautiful red flowers and fruits that turn more red as they mature. And the name does mean bitter in Spanish because it has a very bitter taste. It's widely used in herbal medicine for a whole lot of remedies and cures. Most especially in the Amazon rainforest, it's used in the way that quinine is as a remedy for malaria and fevers and as a digestive aid. But it's going to be a bitter pill to swallow here for Gasper. So it's kind of ironic in its presentation. You've got this really sanguine flower, but ultimately it functions as a restorative. It's a cure-all, but we know cure-alls cure nothing. (laughs) Well, it's very true in this case, because feeling like doom is inescapable, Gasper throws himself on the tracks in front of an oncoming train. Make that train whistle a sad trombone, though, because Harvest only dug down a little and found nothing. This is dark, dark, dark. In the same way, I wondered, actually, if Coppola saw this before the conversation, this ending made me wonder if Ayala had seen Peter Lorre's film, The Lost One, from a few years before. The final thing I wrote was basically, and they're fine, this being the kids. But I'm thinking back to something that you said earlier in the show, about the influence of the parents in the development of the tragic figure. And you were talking about antiquity. And it makes me think a lot about the 60s that we've been talking about recently, especially with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, I was going to say 60 BC. (laughs) It could be 1960s AD that these kids here, it would be Harvest and Esther, are going to grow up in this noir world to then make the foundation for all the angst in the 60s realizing how corrupt their parents were and what their parents did when they were younger that was terrible. It's all this minefield waiting for them to find it. I think you really nail something there. I think that's a great summation there, and I think it really wraps up well how this movie leaves us feeling. I have to put this on my all-time noir top ten. Do you? I'm hesitating. I'm hesitating. It's got to be on there. I'm still thinking about it. Yeah. To me, this is every bit of genre defining as double indemnity or out of the past. It is that potent. It's that drenched in noir characteristics. It's perfectly photographed. But most importantly for me, it's that thing that you were just talking about. I am left with that feeling of deep, dark inevitability that I feel is so crucial to film noir. So let's talk about something less depressing. (laughs) And one of our favorite people in the world, a prince among men, Eddie Muller, and then the Film Noir Foundation for taking the reins to get this restored. Thank you. The story of the condition of this film, when they finally found the negative, Eddie Muller described this as a film curator's nightmare. When we're talking about the conditions they were stored in, weeds were growing up through the floor, no air conditioning... The film canisters were completely rusted shut. It's a miracle that they were able to salvage the original camera negative of this film. He said there were other films in the room that were like bricks. Taking them out of the can, they were just solid, completely unsalvageable. This one managed to escape that fate, however. But oh man, it hurts to think about what else might have been in that collection that was just permanently lost. It also resulted in something really fun, and that's Vasily Lambrinos had never seen this on the big screen with an audience, and he happened to live near MoMA when they were showing it a few years ago, and so he just popped up. Yeah, he was in his 90s at that point. He only passed away two years ago. I would say clean living, but based on what we've seen here in the film, I don't know if that applies or not. A good escape. So then, how about recommendations? What's yours? I have a recommendation for us this time called Carancho from 2010, directed by Pablo Trapero and starring Ricardo Darín and Martina Guzmán. It is about a bottom-feeding attorney who hovers around emergency rooms to try to add to his client list and what happens when he tries to go straight for the love of a young doctor with aspirations of becoming a surgeon. So I am taking us from Argentinian noir to Argentinian neo-noir in this case. 
Like Los Tallos Amargos, it has dubious professional ethics and it shares that DNA of tragedy as well with a lead character that just cannot play it straight no matter how much he might like to. It also has that compact, simple, beautifully dark title too because Carrancho translates to Vulture. So we have no doubt about the territory we occupy from the second we see the title of the film. This is a world that is corrupt from top to bottom. There's a huge industry, as it turns out, in Argentina built on the fact that 8,000 people die in traffic accidents every year. And we soon learn that the associated violence is not always just on the roadways. If you like Argentinian crime films, this is a must-add to your rotation. And you know you're in good hands with Ricardo Darín if you're a fan of stuff like Nine Queens, The Secret in Their Eyes, or The Aura. And what about you? I picked what's probably the low-hanging fruit from this, and that's Spellbound that we mentioned from 1945, directed by Alfred Hitchcock. Strange that you would call something so good in Hitchcock low-hanging fruit. It's just an obvious connection. Is that what you mean? It is. It's a chance for me to mention Hitchcock in Septerica, so that's always a good choice for me. And of course, it's that dream sequence that I think about. Now, Spellbound is not my favorite, but I think these moral and psychological muddles are what make me also recommend it here. It stars Ingrid Bergman and Gregory Peck. Regis Toomey has a small part as well. And it's about a psychiatrist who protects the identity of an amnesia patient accused of murder while attempting to recover his memory, and she falls in love with him. Now, guilt plays a huge role here, and that phrase, guilt complex, turns up time and time again. We have that famous dream sequence inspired by the art of Dolly, and every image is a metaphor. Unlike any dreams that I have, it's clearly explainable from start to finish. But that is drawn out piece by piece as this puzzle is solved. I like it because of its weirdness and its dangerousness. The main character may be a killer. Ingrid Bergman could be in real danger here. But by putting on her glasses, she sets out to be in charge and figures it all out. The opening Shakespearean quote in the credits works here as well. The fault is not in our stars, but in ourselves. The definitive Shakespeare noir quote. So once again, that's two great recommendations, Carancho and Spellbound. And that brings us to the end of episode 113. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magiclantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes now, up to over 60, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. And so you never have to go without Wings Hauser in your life, too. (laughs) Yeah, that's coming up soon. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. Our podcast network, The 25th Frame, is home to a lot of great shows, so please stop by 25thframemedia.com to check out all of our cinema-loving friends and see what they're talking about. We are on Twitter, at Lantern underscore cast, and I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Andy Wolverton, Laura Cannon and the Fatal Films Podcast, the fine gentleman at Fuds on Film, Denzel Escobar, Keith Rich, the folks at Criterion Cast, RJ Tugas, Mike Scharf, Dean Estes, and Mark Falco. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so that we can say thanks. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, The 25th Frame, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcast, you can find us. If you would like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast.
the 25th frame, a listener-supported network celebrating film and culture worldwide.